Hello everyone. A couple minutes early, just making sure everything is working. I am here. I am not a cat. So we're going to read chapter six, seven, and eight today since yesterday, as you may have noticed, I wasn't able to make the live stream, so I will read last night's as well as tonight's scheduled chapters. And I will just give it a couple of minutes until it hits the hour. And then I will begin. All right, five o'clock. Welcome back, everybody. I will just go ahead and begin with chapter six, Our Lips Kept for Jesus. Keep my lips that they may be filled with messages from thee. The days are past forever when we said our lips are our, are our own. Now we know that they are not our own. And yet, how many of my readers often have the miserable consciousness that they have spoken unadvisedly with their lips? How many pray, keep the door of my lips, when the very last thing they think of expecting is that they will be kept? They deliberately make up their minds that hasty words or foolish words or exaggerated words, according to their respective temptations, must and will slip out of that door and that it can't be helped. The extent of the real meaning of their prayer was merely that not quite so many might slip out. As their faith went no farther, the answer went no farther, and so the door was not kept. Do let us look the matter straight in the face. Either we have committed our lips to our Lord, or we have not. This question must be settled first. If not, oh, do not let another hour pass. Take them to Jesus and ask him to take them. But when you have committed them to him, it comes to this. Is he able or is he not able to keep that which you have committed to him? If he is not able, of course you may as well give up at once, for your own experience has abundantly proved that you are not able, so there is no help for you. But if he is able, nay, thank God there is no if on this side, say rather as he is able, where was this inevitable necessity of perpetual failure? You have been fancying yourself virtually doomed and fated to it, and therefore you have gone on in it, while all the time his arm was not shortened so that it could not save. But you have been limiting the Holy One of Israel. Honestly, now, have you trusted him to keep your lips this day? Trust necessarily implies expectation that, when, that what we have entrusted will be kept. If you have not expected him to keep, you have not trusted you may have tried and tried very hard, but you have not trusted, and therefore you have not been kept, and your lips have been the snare of your soul. Proverbs 18.7 Once I heard a beautiful prayer, which I can never forget. It was this, Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take my mind and think through it. Take my heart and set it on fire. And this is the way the master keeps the lips of his servants, by so filling their hearts with his love that the outflow cannot be unloving, by so filling their thoughts that the utterance cannot be unchristlike. There must be filling before there can be pouring out, and if there is filling, there must be pouring out. For he hath said, 
Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. But I think we should look for something more direct and definite than this. We are not all called to be the king's ambassadors, but all who have heard the messages of salvation for themselves are to called to be the Lord's messengers. And day by day, as he gives us opportunity, we are to deliver the Lord's message unto the people. That message, as committed to Haggai, was, I am with you, saith the Lord. Is there not work enough for any lifetime in unfolding and distributing that one message to his own people? Then for those who are still far off, we have that equally full message from our Lord to give out, which he has condensed for us into the one word, come. It is especially sweet part of his dealings with his messengers that he always gives us the message for ourselves first. It is what he has first told us in darkness, that is, in the secrecy of our own rooms, or at least of our own hearts, that he bids us speak in light. And so the more we sit at his feet and watch to see what he has to say to ourselves, the more we shall have to tell to others. He does not send us out with sealed dispatches which we know nothing about and with which we have no concern. There seems a sevenfold sequence in his filling the lips of his messengers. First, they must be purified. The live coal from off the altar must be laid upon them, and he must say, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Then he will create the fruit of them, and this seems to be the great message of peace. Peace to him that is far off, and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. See Isaiah LVII 19. Then comes the prayer, O Lord, open thou my lips, and its sure fulfillment. For then come in the promises, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth, and they shall withal be fitted in thy lips. Then, of course, the lips of the righteous feed many, for the food is the Lord's own giving. Everything leads up to praise, and so we come next to, My mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips, when I remember thee. And lest we should fancy that when rather implies that it is not or cannot be exactly always, we find that the meditation of Jesus throws this added light upon, him, upon it. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to, margin confessing, his name. Does it seem a coming down from the mount to glance at one of our king's commandments, which is specially needful and applicable to this matter of our lips being kept for him? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. None of his commands clash with or supersede one another. Trusting does not supersede watching. It does but complete and effectuate it. Unwatchful trust is a delusion, and untrustful watching is in vain. Therefore, let us not either willfully or carelessly enter into temptation, whether of place or person or topic, which has any tendency to endanger the keeping of our lips for Jesus. Let us pray that grace may be more and more poured into our lips as it was into his, so that our speech may be alway with grace. May they be pure and sweet and lovely, even as his lips like lilies dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. <laughs> We can hardly consider the keeping of our lips without recollecting that upon them, more than all else, though not exclusively of all else, depends that greatest of our responsibilities, our influence. We have no choice in the matter, we cannot evade or avoid it, and there is no more possibility of our limiting it or even tracing its summits than there is of setting a bound to the far vibrating sound waves or watching their flow through the invisible air. Not one sentence that passes these lips of ours, but must be an invisibly prolonged influence, not dying away into silence, but living away into the words and deeds of others. The thought would not be quite so oppressive if we could know what we have done and shall be continuing to do by what we have said. But we never can, as a matter of fact. We may trace it a little way and get a glimpse of some results for good or evil, but we never can see any more of it than we can see of a shooting star flashing through the night with a momentary revelation of one step of its strange path. Even if the next instant plunges it into apparent annihilation as it strikes the atmosphere of the earth, 
we know that it is not really so, but that its mysterious material and force must be added to the complicated materials and forces with which it has come in contact, with a modifying power nonetheless real because it is beyond our ken. And this is not comparing a great thing with a small, but a small thing with a great. For what is material force compared with moral force? What are gases and vapors and elements compared with souls and the eternity for which they are preparing? We all know that there is influence exerted by a person's mere presence without the utterance of a single word. We are conscious of this every day. People seem to carry an atmosphere with them which must be breathed by those whom they approach. Some carry an atmosphere in which all unkind thoughts shrivel up and cannot grow into expression. Others carry one, one in which thoughts of Christ and things divine never seem able to flourish. Have you not felt how a happy conversation about the things we love best is checked or even strangled by the entrance of one who is not in sympathy? Outsiders have not a chance of ever really knowing what delightful intercourse we have one with another about these things, because their very presence chills and changes it. On the other hand, how another person's incoming freshens and develops it and warms us all up and seems to give us, without the least conscious effort, a sort of lift. If even unconscious and involuntary influence is such a power, how much greater must it be when the recognized power of words is added? It has often struck me as a matter of observation that open profession adds force to this influence on whichever side it weighs and also that it has the effect of making many a word and act, by which, which might in other hands have been nearly as neutral as anything can be, tell with by no means neutral tendency on the wrong side. The question of Eliphaz comes with great force when applied to one who desires or professes to be consecrated altogether life and lips. Should he reason with unprofitable talk and with speeches wherewith one can do no good? There is our standard idle words which might have fallen comparatively harmlessly from one who had never named the name of Christ, may be a stumbling block to inquirers, a sanction to the thoughtless juniors, and a grief to thoughtful seniors when they come from lips which are professing to feed many. Even intelligent talk on general subjects by such a one may be a chilling disappointment to some craving heart, which had indulged the hope of getting help comfort or instruction in the things of God by listening to the conversation. It may be a lost opportunity of giving and gaining no one knows how much. How well I recollect this disappointment to myself again and again when a mere child. In those early seeking days, I never could understand why sometimes a good man whom I heard preach or speak as if he loved Christ very much talked about all sorts of other things when he came back from church or missionary meeting. I did so wish he would have talked about the Savior whom I wanted but had not found. It would have been so much more interesting even to the apparently thoughtless and merry little girl. How could he help it, I wondered, if he cared for that pearl of great price, as I was sure I should care for it if I could only find it? And oh, why didn't they ever talk to me about it instead of about my lessons or their little girls at home? They did not know how their conversation was observed and compared with their sermon or speech and how a hungry little soul went away empty from the supper table. The lips of younger Christians may cause, in their turn, no less disappointment. One sorrowful lesson I can never forget, and I will tell the story in hope that it may save others from causes of similar regret. During a summer visit, just after I had left school, a class of girls about my own age came to me a few times for an hour singing. It was very pleasant indeed, and the girls were delighted with the hymns. They listened to all I had to say about time and expression, and not with less attention to the more shyly ventured remarks about the words. Sometimes I accompanied them afterwards down the avenue, and whenever I met any of them I had smiles and plenty of kindly words for each, which they seemed to appreciate immensely. A few years afterward, I sat by the bedside of one of these girls, the most gifted of them all, with both heart and head. She had been led by a wonderful way, and through long and deep suffering, into far clearer light than I enjoyed, and had witnessed for Christ in more ways than one, and far more brightly than I had ever done. 
She told me how sorrowfully and eagerly she was seeking Jesus at the time of those singing classes. And I never knew it because I never asked, and she was too shy to speak first. But she told me more, and every word was a pang to me, how she used to linger in the avenue on those summer evenings, longing that I would speak to her about the Savior, how she hoped week after week that I would just stretch out a hand to help her, just say one little word that might be God's message of peace to her, instead of the pleasant general remarks about the nice hymns and tunes. And I never did. And she went on for months, I think for years after, without the light and gladness which it might have been my privilege to bring to her life. God chose other means, for the souls that he has given to Christ cannot be lost because of the unfaithfulness of a human instrument. But she said, and the words often ring in my ears when I am tempted to let an opportunity slip, Ah, oh, Miss F., I ought to have been yours. Yes, it is true enough that we should show forth his praise not only with our lips, but in our lives. But with very many Christians, the other side of the prayer wants praying. They want rousing up even to wish to show it forth, not only in their lives, but with their lips. I wonder how many, even of those who read this, really pray, O oh Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. And when opened, oh, how much one does want to have them so kept for Jesus that he may be free to make the most of them, not letting them render second-rate and indirect service when they might be doing direct and first-rate service to his cause and kingdom. It is terrible how much less is done for him than might be done in consequence of the specious notion that if what we are doing or saying is not bad, we are doing good in a certain way, and therefore may be quite easy about it. We should think a man rather foolish if he went on doing work which earned five shillings a week, when he might just as well do work in the same establishment and under the same master which would bring him in five pounds a week. But we should pronounce him shamefully dishonest and dishonorable if he accepted such handsome wages as the five pounds, and yet chose to do work worth only five shillings, excusing himself by saying that it was work all the same and somebody had better do it. Do we not act something like this when we take the lower standard and spend our strength in just making ourselves agreeable and pleasant, creating a general good impression in favor of religion, showing that we can be all things to all men, and that one who is supposed to be a citizen of the other world can be very well up in all that concerns this world? This may be good, but is there nothing better? What does it profit if we do make this favorable impression on an outsider? if we go no farther and do not use the influence gained to bring him right inside the fold, inside the only ark of safety. People are not converted by this sort of work. At any rate, I never met or heard of anyone. He thinks it better for his quiet influence to tell, said an affectionately excusing relative of one who had plenty of special opportunities of soul winning, if he had only used his lips as well as his life for his master. And how many souls have been converted to God by his quiet influence all these years, was my reply. And to that there was no answer. For the silent shining was all very beautiful in theory, but not one of the many souls placed specially under his influence had been known to be brought out of darkness into marvelous light. If they had, they must have been known, for such light can't help being seen. When one has even a glimmer of the tremendous difference between having Christ and being without Christ, when one gets but one shuddering glimpse of what eternity is and of what it must mean, as well as what it may mean without Christ, when one gets but a flash of realization of the tremendous fact that all these neighbors of ours, rich and poor alike, will have to spend that eternity either with him or without him, it is hard, very hard indeed, to understand how a man or woman can believe these things at all, and make no effort for anything beyond the temporal elevation of those around, sometimes not even beyond their amusements. People must have entertainment, they urge. I do not find that must in the Bible, but I do find we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And if you have any sort of belief in that, how can you care to use those lips of yours, which might be a fountain of life to the dying souls before you, merely to entertain them at your penny reading or other entertainment. As you sow, you reap. The amusing paper is read, or the lively ballad recited, or the popular song sung, and you reap your harvest of laughter or applause, and of complacence at your success in entertaining the people. And there it ends. 
when you might have sown words from which you and they should reap fruit unto life eternal. Is this worthy work for one who has been bought with such a price that he must say, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all? <laughs> so far from yielding all to that rightful demand of amazing love, he does not even yield the fruit of his lips to it, much less the lips themselves. I cannot refrain from adding that even this lower aim of entertaining is by no means so appreciated as it is supposed. As a cottager of no more than average sense and intelligence remarked, it was all so trifling at the reading, I wish gentlefolks would believe that poor people like something better than what's just to make them laugh. After all, nothing really pays like direct, straightforward, uncompromising words about God and his works and word. Nothing else ever made a man say, as a poor Irishman did when he heard the good news for the first time, Thank you, sir, you've taken the hunger off us today. Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord. What about ours? Well, they are all uttered before the Lord in one sense, whether we will or no. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, thou, O Lord, knowest it all together. How solemn is this thought, but how sweet does it become when our words are uttered consciously before the Lord as we walk in the light of his perpetual presence. Oh, that we may so walk, that we may so speak with kept feet and kept lips, trustfully praying, let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Bearing in mind that it is not only the words which pass their lightly hinged portal, but our literal lips which are to be kept for Jesus, it cannot be out of place before closing this chapter to suggest that they open both ways. What passes in should surely be considered as well as what passes out. And very many of us are beginning to see that the command, whether ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God, is not fully obeyed when we drink, merely because we like it, what is the very greatest obstacle to that, glor to that glory in this realm of England. What matter that we prefer taking it in a more refined form if the thing itself is daily and actively and mightily working misery and crime and death and destruction to thousands, till the cry thereof seems as if it must pierce the very heavens. And so it does, sooner a great deal than it pierces the walls of our comfortable dining room. I only say here, you who have said, take my lips. Stop and repeat that prayer next time you put that to your lips, which is binding men and women hand and foot and delivering them over helpless to Satan. Let those words pass once more from your heart out through your lips, and I do not think you will feel comfortable in letting the means of such infernal work pass in through them. Chapter 7. Our Silver and Gold Kept for Jesus Keep my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. The silver and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Yes, every coin we have is literally our Lord's money. Simple belief of this fact is a stepping stone to full consecration of what he has given us, whether much or little. Then you mean to say we are never to spend anything on ourselves? Not so. Another fact must be considered, the fact that our Lord has given us our bodies as a special personal charge, and that we are responsible for keeping these bodies according to the means given and the work required in working order for him. This is part of our own work. A master entrusts a workman with a delicate machine with which his appointed work is to be done. He also provides him with a sum of money with which he is to procure all that may be necessary for keeping the machine in thorough repair. Is it not obvious that it is the man's distinct duty to see to this faithfully? Would he not be failing in duty if he chose to spend it all on something for somebody else's work or on a present for his master, fancying that would please him better while the machine is creaking and wearing for want of a little oil or working badly for want of a new band or screw? Just so, we are to spend what is really needful on ourselves because it is our charge to do so, but not for ourselves, because we are not our own, but our master's. He, know, he who knoweth our frame knows its needs of rest and medicine, food and clothing, 
and the procuring of these for our own entrusted bodies should be done just as much for Jesus as the greater pleasure of procuring them for someone else. Therefore, there need be no quibbling over the assertion that consecration is not real and complete while we are looking upon a single shilling as our own to do what we like with. Also, the principle is exactly the same. Whether we are spending pence or pounds, it is our Lord's money and must not be spent without reference to him. When we have asked him to take and continually trust him to keep our money, shopping becomes a different thing. We look up to our Lord for guidance to lay out his money prudently and rightly, and as he would have us lay it out. The gift or garment is selected consciously under his eye, and with conscious reference to him as our own dear master, for whose sake we shall give it, or in whose service we shall wear it, and whose own silver or gold we shall pay for it, and then it is all right. But have you found out that it is one of the secrets of the Lord, that when any of his dear children turn aside a little bit after having once entered the blessed, blessed path of true and conscious consecration, he is sure to send them some little punishment? He will not let us go back without a sharp, even if quite secret, reminder. Go and spend ever such a little without reference to him after you have once pledged the silver and gold entirely to him, and see if you are not in some way rebuked for it. Very often, by being permitted to find that you have made a mistake in your purchase, or that in some way it does not prosper. If you observe these things, you will find that the more closely we are walking with our Lord, the more immediate and unmistakable will be his gracious rebukes when we swerve in any detail of the full consecration to which he has called us. And if you have already experienced and recognized this part of his personal dealing with us, you will know also how we love and bless him for it. There is always a danger that just because we say all, we may practically fall shorter than if we had only said some, but said it very definitely. God recognizes this and provides against it in many departments. For instance, though our time is to be all for him, yet he solemnly sets apart the day, one day in seven which is to be specially for him. Those who think they know better than God and profess that every day is a Sabbath little know what floodgates of temptation they are opening by being so very wise above what is written. God knows best, and that should be quite enough for every loyal heart. So as to money, though we place it all at our Lord's disposal and rejoice to spend it all for him, directly or indirectly, yet I am quite certain it is a great help and safeguard, and, what is more, a matter of simple obedience to the spirit of his commands, to set aside a definite and regular proportion of our income or receipts for his direct service. It is a great mistake to suppose that the law of giving the tenth to God is merely Levitical. Search and look for yourselves, and you will find that it is, like the Sabbath, a far older rule, running all through the Bible, and endorsed, not abrogated, by Christ himself. For, speaking of tithes, he said, these ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. To dedicate the tenth of whatever we have is mere duty. Charity begins beyond it. Free will offerings and thank offerings beyond that again. First fruits also should be thus specially set apart. This, too, we find running all through the Bible. There is a tacit appeal to our gratitude in the suggestion of them. The very word implies bounty received and bounty in pro prospect. Bringing the first of the first fruits into the house of the Lord thy God was like saying grace for all the plenty that he was going to bestow on the faithful Israelite. Something of gladness, too, seems always implied. The day of the first fruits was to be a day of rejoicing. Compare it Numbers 28-26, Deuteronomy 16, 10, and 11. There is also an appeal to loyalty. We are commanded to honor the Lord with the first fruits of all our increase. And that is the way to prosper, for the next word is, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty. The friend who first called my attention to this command said that the setting apart first fruits, making a proportion for God's work a first charge upon the income, always seemed to bring a blessing on the rest, and that since this had been systematically done, it actually seemed to go farther than when not thus lessened. Presenting our first fruits should be a peculiarly delightful act, as they are themselves the emblem of our consecrated relationship to God. For of his own will begat he us by the word of truth, 
that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. How sweet and hallowed and richly emblematic our little acts of obedience in this matter become when we throw this light upon them, and how blessedly they may remind us of the heavenly company, singing, as it were, a new song before the throne, for they are the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Perhaps we shall find no better plan of detailed and systematic setting apart than the New Testament one. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. The very act of literally fulfilling this apostolic command seems to bring a blessing with it, as all simple obedience does. I wish, dear friends, you would try it. You will find it a sweet reminder on his own day of this part of your consecration. You will find it an immense help in making the most of your little charities. The regular inflow will guide the outflow and ensure you're always having something for any sudden call for your master's poor or your master's cause. Do not say you are afraid you could not keep to it. What has a consecrated life to do with being afraid? Some of us could tell of such sweet and singular lessons of trust in this matter that they are written in golden letters of love on our memories. Of course, there will be trials of our faith in this, as well as in everything else. But every trial of our faith is but a trial of his faithfulness, and is much more precious than gold which perisheth. What about self-denial, some reader will say. Consecration does not supersede this, but transfigures it. Literally, a consecrated life is and must be a life of denial of self. But all the effort and pain of it is changed into very delight. We love our master. We know surely and absolutely that he is listening and watching our every word and way, and that he has called us to the privilege of walking worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. And in so far as this is a reality to us, the identical things which are still self-denial in one sense become actual self-delight in another. It may be self-denial to us to turn away from something within reach of our purse, which it would be very convenient or pleasant to possess. But if the master lifted the veil and revealed himself standing at our side and let us hear his audible voice asking us to reserve the price of it for his treasury, should we talk about self-denial then? Should we not be utterly ashamed to think of it? Or rather, should we for one instant think about self or self-denial at all? Would it not be an unimaginable joy to do what he asked us to do with that money? But as long as his own unchangeable promise stands written in his word for us, lo, I am with you always, we may be sure that he is with us and that his eye is as certainly on our opened or half-opened purse as it was on the treasury when he sat over against it and saw the two mites cast in. So let us do our shopping as seeing him who is invisible. It is important to remember that there is no much or little in God's sight except as relatively to our means and willingness. For if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. He knows what we have not as well as what we have. He knows all about the low wages in one sphere and the small allowance or the fixed income with rising prices in another. And it is not a question of paying to God what can be screwed out of these, but of giving him all and then holding all at his disposal and taking his orders about the disposal of all. But I do not see at all how self-indulgence and needless extravagance can possibly coexist with true consecration. If we really never do go without anything for the Lord's sake, but just because he has graciously given us means, always supply for ourselves not only every need but every notion, I think it is high time we looked into the matter before God. Why should only those who have limited means have the privilege of offering to their Lord that which has really cost them something to offer? Observe, it is not merely going without something we would naturally like or have to have or do, but going without it for Jesus' sake. Not, I will go without it because after all I can't very well afford it, or because I really ought to subscribe to so-and-so, subscribe to or because I dare say I shall be glad I have not spent the money, but I will do without it because I do want to do a little more for him who so loves me, just that much more than I could do if I did this other thing. I fancy this is more often the hard language of those who have to cut and contrive than of those who are able to give liberally without any cutting and contriving at all. The very abundance of God's good gifts too often hinders from the privilege and delight of really doing without something superfluous or comfortable or usual, 
that they may give just that much more to their Lord. What a pity. The following quotation may, I hope it will, touch some conscience. A gentleman once told us that his wine bill was 100 pounds a year, more than enough to keep a scripture reader always at work in some populous district. And it is one of the countless advantages of total abstinence that it at once sets free a certain amount of money for such work. Smoking, too, is a habit not only injurious to the health in a vast majority of cases, and to our mind very unbecoming in a temple of the Holy Ghost, but also one which squanders money which might be used for the Lord. Expenses in dress might in most people be curtailed, expensive tastes should be denied, and simplicity in all habits of life should be a mark of the followers of him who had not where to lay his head. Then again, the self-indulgence of wealthy Christians who might largely support the Lord's work with, which they, with what they lavish on their houses, their tables, or their personal expenditure is very sad to see. Here the question of jewelry seems to come in. Perhaps it was an instance of the gradual showing of the details of consecration illustrated on page 21, but I will confess that when I wrote Take My Silver and My Gold, it never dawned on me that anything was included beyond the coin of the realm. But the Lord leads on softly, and a good many of us have been shown some capital bits of unenclosed but easily enclosable ground, which have yielded pleasant fruit. Yes, very pleasant fruit. It is wonderfully nice to light upon something that we really never thought of as a possible gift to our Lord, and just to give it straight away to Him. I do not press the matter, but I do ask my lady friends to give it fair and candid and prayerful consideration. Which do you most really care about, a diamond on your finger or a star in the Redeemer's kingdom shining forever and ever? That is what it comes to, and there I leave it. On the other hand, it is very possible to be fairly faithful in much, and yet unfaithful in that which is least. We may have thoughts about our gold and silver, and yet have been altogether thoughtless about our rubbish. Some have a habit of hoarding away old garments, pieces, remnants, and odds and ends generally, under the idea that they will come in useful some day, very likely setting it up as a kind of mild virtue, backed by that noxious old saying, keep it by you seven years and you'll find a use for it. And so the shabby things get shabbier, and moth and dust doth corrupt, and the drawers and places get choked and crowded. And meanwhile, all this that is sheer rubbish to you might be made useful at once, to a degree beyond what you could guess, to some poor person. It would be a nice variety for the clever fingers of a lady's maid to be set work to work to do up old things. Or some tidy woman may be found in almost every locality who knows how to contrive children's things out of what seems to you only fit for the rag bag either for her own little ones or those of her neighbors. My sister trimmed 70 or 80 hats every spring for several years with the contents of friends' rubbish drawers, thus relieving dozens of poor mothers who liked their children to go tidy on Sunday and also keeping down finery in her Sunday school. Those who literally fulfilled her request for rubbish used to marvel at the results. Little scraps of carpet, torn old curtains, faded blinds, and all such gear go to a wonderfully long way towards making poor cottagers and older sick people comfortable. I never saw anything in this rubbish line yet that could not be turned to good account somehow with a little considering of the poor and their discomforts. I wish my lady reader would just leave this book now and go straight upstairs and have a good rummage at once and see what can be thus cleared out. If she does not know the right recipients at first hand, let her send it off to the nearest working clergyman's wife and see how gratefully it will be received. For it is a great trial to workers among the poor not to be able to supply the needs which they see. Such supplies are far, far more useful than treble their small money value. Just a word of earnest pleading for needs closely veiled but very sore, which might be wonderfully lightened if this wardrobe overhauling were systematic and faithful. There are hundreds of poor clergymen's families to whom a few old garments or any household oddments are as great a charity as to any of the poor under their charge. There are two societies for aiding these with such gifts, under initials which are explained in the reports, the PPC Society, Secretary Miss Bree, Batten Hall Place, Worcester, and the AFD Society, Secretary Miss Hinton, for York Place, Clifton. 
I only ask my lady friends to send for a report to either of these devoted secretaries, and if their hearts are not so touched by the cases of brave and bitter need that they go forthwith to wardrobes and drawers to see what can be spared and sent, they are colder and harder than I give English women credit for. There is no bondage in consecration. The two things are opposites and cannot coexist, much less mingle. We should suspect our consecration and come afresh to our great counselor about it directly we have any sense of bondage. As long as we have an unacknowledged feeling of fidget about our account book and a smothered wondering what and how much we ought to give and a hushed up wishing the thing had not been put quite so strongly before us, depend upon it we have not said unreservedly take my silver and my gold. And how can the Lord keep what he has not been sincerely asked to take? Ah, if we had stood at the foot of the cross and watched the tremendous payment of our redemption with the precious blood of Christ, if we had seen that awful price told out drop by drop from his own dear patient brow and torn hands and feet till it was all paid and the central word of eternity was uttered, it is finished, should we not have been ready to say, not a mite will I withhold? My jewels. Shall I hold them back, my jewels? Time has traveled many a day since I laid them by forever, safely locking them away, and I thought them yielded wholly, when I dared no longer wear gems contrasting oh so sadly with the adorning I would bear. Shall I keep them still, my jewels? Shall I, can I yet withhold from that loving, living Savior aught of silver or of gold? Gold so needed that his gospel may resound from sea to sea. Can I know Christ's service lacketh, yet forget his unto me? No, I lay them down, my jewels, truly on the altar now. Stay, I see a vision passing of a gem-encircled brow. Heavenly treasure worn by Jesus, souls won through my gift outpoured. Freely, gladly will I offer jewels thus to crown my Lord. From Woman's Work. And our last chapter. For today, our intellects kept for Jesus. Keep my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. There are two distinct sets of temptations which assail those who have or think they have rather less, and those who have or think they have rather more than an average share of intellect, while those who have neither less nor more are generally open in some degree to both. The refuge and very present help from both is the same. The intellect, whether great or small, which is committed to the Lord's keeping, will be kept and will be used by him. The former class are tempted to think themselves excused from effort to cultivate and use their small intellectual gifts, to suppose they cannot, need, cannot or need not seek to win souls because they are not so clever and apt in speech as so-and-so, to attribute to want of gift what is really want of grace, to hide the one talent because it is not five. Let me throw out a thought or two for these. Which is greatest, gifts or grace? Gifts are given to every man according to his several ability. That is, we have just as much given as God knows we are able to use, and what he knows we can best use for him. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, Claiming and using that royal measure of grace, you may and can and will do more for God than the mightiest intellect in the world without it. For which, in the clear light of his word, is likely to be the most effectual, the natural ability, which at its best and fullest without Christ can do nothing, observe and believe that word, or the grace of our almighty God and the power of the Holy Ghost, which is as free to you as it ever was to anyone. If you are responsible for making use of your limited gift, are you not equally responsible for making use of the grace and power which are to be had for the asking, which are already yours in Christ, and which are not limited? Also, do you not see that when there are great natural gifts, people give the credit to them instead of to the grace which alone did the real work, and thus God is defrauded of the glory? So that, to say it reverently, God can get more glory out of a feeble instrument because then it is more obvious that the excellency of the power is of God and not of us. 
Will you not henceforth say, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me? Don't you really believe that the Holy Spirit is just as able to draw a soul to Jesus, if he will, by your whisper of the one word, come, as by an eloquent sermon an hour long? I do. At the same time, as it is evidently God's way to work through these intellects of ours, we have no more right to expect him to use a mind which we are willfully neglecting, and taking no pains whatever to fit for his use, than I should have to expect you to write a beautiful inscription with my pen, if I would not take the trouble to wipe it and mend it. The latter class are tempted to rely on their natural gifts, and to act and speak in their own strength. To go on too fast without really looking up at every step and for every word, to spend their Lord's time in polishing up their intellects, nominally for the sake of influence and power and so forth, while really, down at the bottom, it is for the sake of the keen enjoyment of the process, and perhaps most of all to spend the strength of these intellects for that which doth not profit, in yielding to the specious snare of reading clever books on both sides, and eating deliberately of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The mere mention of these temptations should be sufficient appeal to conscience. If consecration is to be a reality anywhere, should it not be in the very thing which you own as an extra gift from God, and which is evidently closest, so to speak, to his direct action, spirit upon spirit? And if the very strength of your intellect has been your weakness, will you not entreat him to keep it henceforth really and entirely for himself? It is so good of him to have given you something to lay at his feet. Shall not this goodness lead you to lay it all there, and never hanker after taking it back for yourself or the world? Do you not feel that in very proportion to the gift you need the special keeping of it? He may lead you by a way you know not in the matter. Very likely he will show you that you must be willing to be a fool for his sake first before he will condescend to use you much for his glory. Will you look up into his face and say, Not willing? He who made every power can use every power, memory, judgment, imagination, quickness of apprehension or insight, specialties of musical, poetical, oratorical, or artistic faculty, special tastes for reasoning, philosophy, history, natural science, or natural history. All these may be dedicated to him, sanctified by him, and used by him. Whatever he has given, he will use if we will let him. Often, in the most unexpected ways and at the most unexpected turns, something read or acquired long ago suddenly comes into use. We cannot foresee what will thus come in useful, but he knew, when he guided us to learn it, what it would be wanted for in his service. So may we not ask him to bring his perfect foreknowledge to bear on all our mental training and storing, to guide us to read or study exactly what he knows there will be use for in the work to which he has called or will call us? Nothing is more practically perplexing to a young Christian whose preparation time is not quite over or perhaps painfully limited than to know what is most, most worth studying, what is really the best investment of the golden hours, while yet the time has not come for the field of active work to be fully entered, and the thoroughly furnishing of the mind is the evident path of present duty. Is not his name called Counselor, and will he not be faithful to the promise of his name in this as well as in, as in all else? The same applies to every subsequent stage. Only let us be perfectly clear about the principle that our intellect is not our own, either to cultivate or to use or to enjoy, and that Jesus, and that Jesus Christ is our real and ever-present counselor. And then there will be no more worry about what to read and how much to read, and whether to keep up one's accomplishments or one's languages or one's ologies. If the master has need of them, he will show us, and if he has not, what need have we of them? If we go forward without his leading, we may throw away some talent or let it get too rusty for use, which would have been most valuable when other circumstances arose or different work was given. We must not think that keeping means not using at all. What we want is to have all our powers kept for his use. In, these, in this, they will probably find far higher development than in any other part, sort of use. I know cases in which the effect of real consecration on mere mental development has been obvious and surprising to all around. Yet it is only a confirmation of what I believe to be a great principle, viz. that the Lord makes the most of whatever is unreservedly surrendered to him. 
There will always be plenty of waste in what we try to cut out for ourselves, but he wastes no material. And that brings us to the end of today's chapters. I will plan to be back again tomorrow, same time, 5 p.m. Pacific time, for the next couple of chapters. So I will see you then.